Merry Christmas, everyone! Again, it's almost too strange that these days, when we actually claim that Merry Christmas around the world, and given the fact we're looking at social and political polarization, it's almost challenging to realize that we're democracy. It's even getting more vulnerable and even more challenging. Even what we say, the structure of democracy today is still standing at the crossroads. If you follow the news closely, now in this episode, we need to gear back our attention to the nation of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now it's almost strange. Towards the end of 2023, this nation is undergoing what we called a presidential election, and some call it the、uh, the current election process. It's illegal, or there's a potential that this result of the election is going to be fraudulent. How can we understand the current political system in the nation of Congo, and what does that mean when the opposition party、uh, candidate stood out to claim that whatever the result, it's not going to be valid? Well, is that so? And also, what is The future for the nation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite our distinguished speaker, who is Scott Morgan. Scott has been the president of Red Eagle Enterprises since its inception in November 2012. He uses his experience from serving in the U.S. military to address various projects. Of course, he is currently based in Washington D.C. and he specializes in U.S. policy towards Africa, focusing on security and religious liberty concerns of South of Sahara. Well, Scott, and welcome back to the Missing Piece, and Merry Christmas to you. Good morning and Merry Christmas, and for 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 some of our fellow listeners who will be listening to this podcast. We should also say Happy Boxing Day. There you go. Well, of course, yeah, Happy Boxing Day. Well, Scott, I want to get started now. As we mentioned before, Democratic Republic of Congo and this nation is undergoing this presidential election. Now, let's start with the first fundamental question: How significant is the presidential election these days? And why some of the candidates from the opposition party believe that there will be or there are massive fraud regarding the current election process. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's very. It's important for several reasons. On a personal level, one, the poll, the re- most recent poll was take took place. On my birthday, so I was hoping for a nice birthday present、mm. of a calm, peaceful election. But we all know that did not happen.、Mm-mm. There were serious logistical challenges. We had polling stations that did not open on time. The machines were not calibrated and linked up, so that was another issue. And you know that means well. And we should also forget, should not forget, I should say, elections in the Congo are a major logistical challenge for the, for Seni, the Independent National Electoral Commission.、Mm. Previous the last few presidential polls, some of the logistical heavy lifts, like transporting machines and ballots and. And even the ballot papers themselves, they actually had the UN mission, peacekeeping mission in the country, assist with the transportation of those electoral necessities, which we actually will take for we for granted. And now, at the end of this year, the peacekeepers will withdraw. So. That will place an additional hurdle now on future elections. So it was so basically what what the opposition challengers are saying is like with these logistical hurdles and then and what has happened as of December twentieth that you know 
they're assuming that the fix is in. Whether or not it's true or not, we don't know. But another sign that we that falls into their camp of of alleging electoral, you know, the elections being stolen, is that the results are actually going to be slow roll because they actually said we had to wait till the end of the year up until so by this time on Sunday we should actually know who the next. Whether or not President Shishishadi was re-elected or mm. not, most of the numbers that have been released have been the diaspora vote, which shows you know, the incumbent with a large lead, you know, and there was some expectation of that. So that so now you know they still have to wait for the ballots to be counted, and then we'll have to say you know, like the government will say one thing. The electoral commission may say another, but it, it, the truly accurate numbers may actually come from the Catholic Church and their observers. Mm. Well, brother, before we bring the Catholic Church into our conversation, I want to read a statement which was made by one of the main opposition candidates. Again, this is what he said regarding the ongoing election process, and I quote, In this phase of this unacceptable situation, we are calling for the immediate annulment of this chaotic election, tainted by massive fraud. Now, not to compare with what's happening in the U.S. today, if we remember that back in 2020, that the former U.S. President Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump, also claimed the whole U.S. election that which won by President Joe Biden was fraud, uh, was a fraud. So, in other words, within this political party, within this political system, someone or a massive group of people were trying to manipulate the structure, undermine the legitimacy of the election process. Well, this is what happened in the U.S., or this is what would to believe happened in the U.S. But I want to go back to the nation of uh, uh, Congo, that how much do we believe that the opposition candidate to say such election process should be completely dissolved because of this uh, uh, illegitimacy or this chaotic election? But going back to the question, what was the chaos during the process, and by calling it as a chaotic election, how believable is it, or how believable was it of the words? What do you say to that? The elections did not run smoothly. We all know that there were polling stations that never even opened. There are also, you know, there are problems with the machines as well. But also a week before the polls actually took place, there was actual there was a reports of a fire at the headquarters of the electoral commission in Kinshasa, which destroyed several numbers of ballots. And there is an estimate that maybe up to twenty percent of the registered electorate in the country would not be able to have their voices heard. Mm. Is basically problematic but you know some you know democracy is also a, is a spectator it's not just a spectator sport you know you have to show up and get involved in the process otherwise you don't have a legitimate claim when you when you say when you cry foul because when it and i say this not just about the congo but i actually said this to americans so basically if you're complaining about something and you don't vote, then you can't really criticize because you didn't take part in the process. You know, you're out. It's always easier for someone to stand on the outside and throw a rock than it is for someone to actually get involved in the process. So now, you know, basically, if you're looking at these of James Carville back in 1992, and what he wrote on their whiteboard at Clinton, at Clinton campaign headquarters, which basically was change versus more of the same. 
that it, it's you know and, and as you know there have been several other minor incidents that have actually taken place we know there's at least two journalists that the, that the drc government has arrested and taken into custody for covering uh you know opposition protests you know over this past weekend there is the mysterious death of an EU election observer in Kinshasa, which the police are actually claiming to be suicide. So, you know, you have all these minute little events, which, you know, individually, they don't mean a lot. But if you put them, but if you have, but if you can put them together properly, they do show signs of a problem within the DRC. Mm. Ever since, ever since long, Joseph Kabila was first elected, from a logistical standpoint, nationwide elections in the Congo have, are a logistical nightmare. Mm. That's with the transport, you know, transportation of ballots, securing the ballot process. I mean, not, not, not I mean, not just the ballot, the physical ballot, but also make sure the data is trans, you no, know, counting the ballots and then transmitting them back to the election headquarters and the stuff. All that is a challenge. Mm. Those are awful things that we in the West here take for granted. So, mm. Brother, I want to ask you about the current political stability in the nation of Congo. I mean, again, we know that for a country which undergoes presidential election, it matters. I mean, again, that's a reality. It matters to every single citizen, regardless of if the person or if the voter is going to vote or is going to cast the vote or not. But still, the fate of the country is going to impact on each one of the uh, current citizen of the country. But meanwhile, I want to ask you, as we are seeing this debate, as we're seeing this dispute regarding the legitimacy of the presidential election, what is the current political situation or the political uh, 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 stability in the country today. We need to understand the base and the root of the political system in order to understand the future or to predict the future for the country. So what do you say to that? You know, the DRC has the Franco-Belgian style of government, has a strong central, strong central leader, and you have a prime minister, and minister, many members of the cabinet office in parliament. Um, internal politics, there are several, you know, several tribal issues. Tri there are several issues. The, the main issue has to be the insurgencies in the Eastern DRC, part of which are still a light, are, are a legacy of the dying days of the Mobutu regime. And, and for a major part of the problem is still the legacy of the Rwanda genocide because there are groups that are actually tied to Rwanda, tied to Rwanda whether they're the former Hutu government that was driven out over almost 30 years ago or proxies that support that are supported by current president Rwandan president Kagame. They're still active in the East, which, and that brings up one point is, and during one of his final campaign rallies, President Shichasheti did state that if you elect me, I will go to war with Rwanda. Mm. You know, that did not garner a lot of coverage here in the West, but that is a very important point because, as you know, there's still proxy wars um, you have one group, the ADF, which is actually Ugandan, originally originating in Uganda, that have launched two attacks over the holiday season, both in Uganda. You have a Burundian militia called Red Taraba, based in, also based in the Eastern DRC, targeted towards Burundi. They launched an attack on Friday evening, the 23rd, killed at least 20 people in Burundi. They're based in the Eastern DRC and they're having Burundian troops on, in the DRC searching for them. 
it's announced today that it was also announced today, this very day, you know, within the last couple of hours as we're recording this, the Ugandan troops have pulled that were assigned with the EAC mission that have pulled out. Now that you actually we are actually starting to see rise, signs of rising tension with Kenya as well, because uh, a couple of some politicians and the one of the rebel groups and twenty three their leadership met in Nairobi mm-hmm. and held held a press conference and actually wanted to form a union because M twenty three wants to get involved in the peace process. And that did not set well with the current leadership in Kinshasa. You know, in spite of the poli- in, st- in spite of the political turmoil, the economic outlook of the DRC is actually pretty robust. You know, the there's an actual deal, you know, with between the DRC, Zambia, and Angola to set up a clean and safe trade route for extractive minerals, which the U.S. has put together, you know, that is, you know, that shows signs of economic viability in the country. You know, as you know, there's the government still trying to encourage economic investment. And, you know, they have actually have been set trade missions. And basically, it's like, and they're stating, you know, even the World Bank says that, you know, the DRC has been one of their fastest faster growing economies in the world, people that are tech savvy, but most of the issues are still in the East where most of the conflict minerals are, you know. Not you know, not just the minerals that are used in smartphones like we're we're talking on, but there's also gold and a small in an area where there's also petroleum. So mm. and, you know, and those is and those are focused more north towards like Elbert. So so you know the eat you know People are jockeying not just for position in the East, they're actually seeking to control the mineral bases and, you know, and the country that has a stranglehold on those mineral outlets right now just happens to be China. Mm. Brother, I want to ask you about this geographical location of DRC. I mean, again, when we look at the African continent, based on previous conversation, There is no denying that every single country is uniquely positioned on the land of or continent of Africa. But when it comes to the geographical location, as you mentioned before, DRC currently um, is landlocked among Rwanda, you know, Zambia, you know, all those countries. But from political standpoint or from this political assessment, is that a disadvantage or that is actually a vantage for Congo continue to expand or continue to uh, build relationship with neighboring countries? I mean, again, we're looking at 2023. The last thing we want, Scott, you and I, we can agree, is we want to see any additional conflict. We don't want to see additional wars. But meanwhile, how should we assess this geographical location of DRC today in order to understand this political growth or the political development for the country? What do you say to that? I think the when it comes to the DRC, and there's another way to put the size of the country to get to to have people understand it. We're actually talking about a country that is about as large in area as the eastern half of the United States, east of the Mississippi. Mm. And another, and I think another way people are starting to look at it is, uh, for potential economic growth is, you know, the Congo River, uh, you know, and as many tributaries, you know, the potential is there just for hydroelectric power, you know, that is something that some, that is an avenue that some people are seeking to, I won't say exploit, but seeking to enhance, you know, that potential is always there. And when the Obama administration rolled out its Power Africa initiative, when they wanted to, to elect you know, the increased electrical output to the continent, you know, one of my personal criticisms of, of it is like, 
I like the idea, but you're going to omit the Congo River Basin. Why? And then you, you think about the political instability in the East, and that's probably one of the reasons why. But, yeah, as you know, besides that, you know, being in the central part of Africa, you know, the Congo River is the major economic lifeline, not just for the DRC, but for other areas, you know, you have Congo, besides Congo, Brazzaville, and in some cases, Car as well. Those, you know, those are their outlets to the sea as well. So people, people often forget just how important of an economic lifeline the Congo River is. Mm. Scott, two more questions before letting you go. Let's talk about the reaction from the younger generations today. I mean, again, previously throughout the entire year, you and I, we had several significant and major discussions regarding the countries in Africa. And there's no denying that uh, youth today or the younger generations today are rather very much interested in deciding or contributing to the face of the country. So what about the reaction in DRC today among the younger generations? Are they really excited about the current incumbent president, which is Felix Shisakiri, or they're more looking forward to a political shift or political a makeover in order to see something much better and in order to, uh, let's say, uh, see the hope and see the change that is necessary for the country. What do you say to that? We probably won't see an actual answer to that until the final polls are actually released. The majority of the numbers that have actually been released for show the current incumbent in the lead have been the diaspora. Mm. That being said, it was the youth turnout to put the current incumbent in office in the first place. Mm. And we were, you know, you know, generally in the Western democracies, you actually see, well, I should say in the US, you generally see the younger people, the, the youth generally do not turn out for the U.S. election. Why? That boggles me. But we should see what the, how the numbers are because, as you know, the one of the things that will probably antagonize, could antagonize people is the drip, drip, drip of the election results being released. And in this, and in this area of having instant economic results and, and Results, regardless of whether it's financial transactions, sending emails, whatever, you know, people are starting to get used to that and now they're starting to expect it in other form. I mean, look at we saw the elections in Sierra Leone earlier this year, where they actually had the polls and counted everything and had the results released within 12 hours. Mm. We are looking at that today, U.S., Again, I'm not the expert on foreign policy, but as a journalist, I think it's time that we understand in order to make the foreign policy more effective and also looking at the strategies dealing with some of the countries that who are not fully taking advantage of the financial gains is definitely deserve some questions. And again, as we're looking at the future for DRC, we don't know the result of this election until Sunday, but there's no denying that every single country should continue to honor and value, and most importantly, to elevate and protect the concept of democracy. And again, as we're looking ahead in year 2024, the African continent continue generate much greater noises, not just for US, but also for, again, bigger players like China, countries in Europe, and I hope and I pray that more leaders are able to come together, continue to honor the presence of those countries in Africa. Any final thoughts, Scott? Well, you know, you bring up, uh, bring up a very important point because, you know, there, you know, there are actually other countries in the world. On the continent itself, we're starting to see Rwanda project, its, project itself as a major power player, you know, its presence in northern Mozambique. Hmm. And its current efforts, you know, in Benin and Togo, as well as uh, Central African Republic. 
you know, Turkey is becoming a major player in Africa as well, as are the Saudis and the Emirates. So, mm. so, so that will be interesting to watch. And also when it comes to elections, you know, I think there's over 20 elections that will be held in Africa in 2024. Mm. Well, I'm sure, Scott, I'm going to have you back on the show, probably not for all the 24 presidential elections but we are going to surely talk about some of the major, majorly important ones. Well, again, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite Scott Morgan to be back on the show. Again, Scott has been the president of Red Eagle Enterprises since its inception in November 2012. And he used his experiences from serving in the U.S. military to address various projects. And he's the expert on, uh, again, international relationships, particularly related to the countries in Africa. Well, brother, thank you so much for your time. Again, I know it's uh, Christmas time. Of course, that upcoming very soon, we're going to celebrate New Year. I hope that in the year of 2024, we're going to see more of your analysis and also your assessment regarding the current affairs around the world. So thank you so much for doing this. And... Happy New Year.